Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in today's webinar. My name is Aditi and I am the ambassador of Buzz at Tatwik Analytics. So to give you a brief introduction of what Tatwik is and what we do, uh, we are an authorized Google partner for reselling Google Analytics 360 license and we are also one of the leading providers of data analytics solutions and consulting for SMEs and large enterprises. Today, this webinar on five most common user experience mistakes and how to avoid them shall be presented by one of, uh, sorry, by our um, UX expert, Riddhi Mehta. So just a few things before we get started. Uh, how to interact today. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. I will bring them up at the end of the presentation and we'll be sure to answer as many questions as time permits. In case we miss out on your questions, please rest assured, Riddhi and I, both of us, will get back in touch with you uh, personally with answers to all your queries. I will also be carrying out a couple of polls during this webinar. It will just uh, help us to get to know you guys better. And we also have a, a cool free takeaway for all our attendees towards the end of the webinar. Uh, so stay tuned to find out what it is. All right, so before we get started, as promised, I'm going to run this one poll to know whether or not you guys uh, perform A-B tests and UX audits regularly. Everybody has different UX needs. So based on your answers, Riddhi will be able to tweak the content as we move forward in our session and she'll also be able to give you good ideas for A-B tests from her use cases as well. Okay, so we have a set of a few answers. We're going to run the poll for 10 more seconds and we will then move on. All right, so we have an interesting mix of answers. I'm just going to share the poll with you guys so that you have an idea of what kind of an audience we have today. 50% of our attendees say yes, we perform A-B tests and UX audits regularly. 33% of you guys uh, intend to, but you haven't started yet. And 70% of you uh, do not perform it regularly. So we have a great audience today here, Riddhi. And I recognize some names from, the, from a few of our previous webinars, our last few webinars. A big shout out to you guys for joining us. Thanks again for joining us. And thank you guys for taking the poll. Now, without any further ado, I'm going to turn over this session to you, Riddhi. Please take over. Hello, so guys. Uh, so, as Aditi told you, our today's webinar is on five UX mistakes and how you can avoid them. This is going to be our agenda. Uh, there will be an introduction with five UX mistakes followed by a conclusion. To begin with, we should understand that design is one of the most evolving fields. Each year, there is a different trend that gets followed like uh, 3D design, minimalist design, flat design and more. But jumping onto the new trend without keeping the users in mind could hurt the UX. It is not suggested to emulate the usability of a process while trying to create something trendy. User experience is the utmost important matter to keep in mind while designing any interface or product. One needs to balance the looks with usability. Whilst I talk about the five common mistakes that designers make these days, I will also touch upon how one can avoid making the same errors. Right, so uh, here I, what I'm going to do is launch another poll. Uh, I know it's pretty close together with the previous poll, but uh, we would love to know how you guys implement your A-B tests and your website personalizations uh, for the website. So uh, there are a lot of, a lot of companies have an in-house UX department or UX team and also there are a lot of external softwares and agencies available who do it beautifully so I we would just love to get a sense of the kind of audience that we have today thanks a lot for the reply if you guys want to see the trend I'm just going to share it with you so okay 13% of our attendees use an external software or have uh, agencies for assistance a huge 75% of you guys do it in-house, which is the trend right now, which is awesome. We do the same at Tatwik. We have an in-house UX team. And 13% of you are, are on the outlook for assistance. All right. Awesome. So, Riddhi, what's next? Guys, let's begin with our first case, which is a usage of light fonts over a low-contrast background. 
as we all know, light fonts have been trending lately. Example, Robotolite, Helvetica Light, and more. A lot of apps and websites prefer using them nowadays. Light fonts make the design look fresh, elegant, and sleek. If you want to put your image in the market as a modern and up-to-date brand, using light fonts is one of the popular ways of doing that. However, using light fonts over a low contrast background can cause readability issues, sometimes making the text almost unreadable. As you can see in the image, the text used for body is light and it helps build an elegant modern looking interface. But at the same time, it is difficult to read, especially for users with poor eyesight. This problem is crucial when it comes to mobile applications because smaller displays can cause more readability issues. Also, usage of cell phones in outdoor environments will create an even further low contrast due to further lighting. So how can we avoid this? It is very important to remember that legibility comes before beautification. As Apple stated in their iOS human interface guidelines, if users cannot read the words in your app, it doesn't matter how beautiful the typography is. You need to make sure that there is enough contrast between the fonts and the background used. According to web usability guidelines, that contrast ratio of text to background would be 4.5 to 1. Wow, Rivi, that's really insightful. I did not know that we could... Uh you know, have a contrast ratio of text to background. And I also actually did not know that this is the ratio. So is there any way uh, I can check uh, my contrast ratio so that I don't make these mistakes that we're talking about? Yeah, sure, Aditi. Uh, I'll share a link over here. Uh, so this is a GitHub link where you can check your contrast ratio. Over here, you will be allowed to input a hex code for your background color as well as a hex code for your text and accordingly it will give you a ratio. Also, you can use user testing to find more about any readability issues that your users might have come across different displays, example, desktops, laptops, tablets, cell phones, etc. And so here's just a comparison to show you how light and uh, regular fonts work and what's the comparison of both the scenarios. So let's move on to our second, uh, second point, which is overloading users with information. We all need to understand that our display space is a valuable resource. In order to take advantage of this resource, sometimes designers tend to overfill it with information, features, and more. However, it must be kept in mind that when a user comes across such an overloaded and overwhelming interface, there are more chances of him being frustrated and abandoning the user journey midway. Items on overloaded pages compete for users' attention, making it difficult for him to select what he actually wants. Each line of text, button, or even an image complicates the process more. Like over here, we have an image from Blockbuster. Blockbuster presents so much data that sometimes it leaves the user confused or unable to make a decision about what to watch. Similarly, for a 3D fan club webs, uh, website, there's so many widgets and small bits of disparate information and resources on the page that uh, rather than presenting a cohesive message with a clear hierarchy of information, your field of view is completely stuffed with individual elements competing for your attention. The user would not be able to comprehend or process information effectively if the information architecture is cluttered or the page layout is too dense. So how do we avoid this? Remove all the information that isn't absolutely necessary for the user. This will reduce the cognitive load for the user. Present your information in a manner that is easily understandable by the user. Usage of short sentences, bullet points, blog keywords will make it easier for the user to comprehend just by scanning without having to read everything piece by piece. Use enough white space as white space is equally important to the content that is being presented white space is also crucial for content prioritization as well as readability and it adds aesthetic value to your page layout moving on to a third case which is using non-obvious gestures and for options and actions as we discussed earlier Information overload for user makes it difficult for him to process and comprehend the data being presented. In order to reduce this overload, 
Certain designers tend to remove information and other visual controls and introduce gestures in their place. Like as you can see on your screens, we have an example of an uh, application that allows you to set alarms. However beautiful that this application looks, it is not a very user friendly application when it comes to setting up alarms. Similarly, the iPhone calculator does not have a delete or a backspace button. But the users are not properly, properly introduced to the feature of swiping right to remove numerals. Or when it comes to the case of zooming into maps, using just one finger instead of two to zoom in into the map. While hiding information could make the interface look cleaner, it could also make the user's journey harder if the user is not well introduced to those gestures. Unless a user has prior information about the gesture, it won't be easy for him to use it. So how can we avoid this? The basic rules of UX design is to make the user's journey easier and reduce the amount of effort that the user has to put in in order to achieve the goal he has in mind. Hiding options will reduce the visibility of features for the user. If you want to add new gestures, enough visible cues should be given to the user so that he is well acknowledged with those gestures. Like as you can see on your screens, I have an example of a game wherein intuitively you are being told to move the blob from left to right in order to play the game. Riddhi, I, had, I just had a question here. Is, um, is there any way or are there maybe ways to communicate what gestures are to be used for uh, a simpler user journey or for in an app like I want to do something is there a way where I can instruct my users that this is how you can navigate through my app definitely Aditi there are a lot of ways in which you can do that like uh, this example that you see flashing on your screens right now it's a shopping app works somewhat like Tinder, but it intuitively tells you to swipe left, right or top in order to delete, favorite or pick an item. Also you can use uh, static gestures to show your users like how this website is doing it or while onboarding the users onto your application you can uh, show an animation. Also Luke Wabrowski provides some great insights on building visual cues on your website or applications to direct users towards gesture indications. I hope this is helpful, Aditi. Yes, Riddhi, absolutely. I think this just eliminates the whole uh, trial and error uh, methodology of users actually getting to know your app. I think it's a great way to communicate. Thanks a lot. Uh, sure, Aditi. So let's move on to our fourth case, which is using unlabeled and abstract icons. Sometimes it is tempting for us to save space while designing interfaces and we might cut down on icon titles in order to do so. Pictograms help save space and give design aesthetic sense while making it appealing for the users. But sometimes when key functionalities get hidden behind such icons, usability issues can arise. One might assume that the users are familiar with icons or that the users might be willing to spend some time to figure out functionalities. But in reality, such kind of interfaces intimidate the users due to the unfamiliarity that the users face. Users really want to know what the outcome of their action is going to be before they take that particular action which could involve just the click of a button. All right, so since we've uh, talked so much about icons and the importance of uh, naming these icons, I uh, wanted to know, it's, a, it's a, a, maybe a very simple question, a simple doubt. Should we always have icon titles for all the icons? Like, is there no exception at all? Uh, of course, Aditi, there is an exception. Unless and until the icons are universally recognized, example, home, search, print, cart, etc. always have a title accompanying them. Other ways to uh, avoid this error would be keeping a proper font size for the icon title so that the legibility is not lost. Also maintain a good space between the icon and its title to make it appear less cluttered at the bottom. Let's move on to a fifth case which is using extensive forms. Acquiring user details is an important part of business but a poorly designed form can lead to loss of customers and ultimately affect the conversion rate. 
almost all websites have a form that requires some or other detail from users in terms of their personal information. They could be inquiry forms, contact us forms, feedback forms, or just a simple sign up form. Over here on your screens, we have a moving form. Now, you can know that it would take you way longer than it should have to fill out this form because of the order in which you will need to enter your information. It is very important to give utmost importance to these forms as ultimately they help you generate leads and further conversions. If a form frustrates a user and makes him abandon the process, then your business gets affected. Making even smaller changes to your forms could boost your conversions. Try to avoid having more than a column in your forms. Okay, so uh, I understand what you're saying and it's very obvious that, uh, you know, two column forms in this case that you've shown, the example that you've shown is pretty confusing. But maybe there is a way where we can have a two column form or is there any exception, again, an exceptional uh, use case where it's okay to have a two column form? Oh uh, yeah, sure, Aditi, I understand your question. Sometimes uh, we face constraints in terms of design or constraints in terms of space when uh, trying to use forms on our websites. In that case, if you ever want to have a two column form, then try to make the uh, fields flow from top to bottom instead of fields flowing from left to right. In this way, your users will go column by column instead of going crisscross in terms of uh, horizontal rows. I hope I've answered your question, Aditi. Yes, it does make sense now. Uh, I went through the same, I think, when you were working on the uh, web, Tathwe website revamp. So I had to just ask this question to you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we've uh, also uh, put this principle in action when it comes to our forms on the Tathwe website. You will soon see an example. So what are other ways of uh, avoiding it? Uh, other ways of avoiding it would be don't have a very long form. Example, if you have a 20 field form, break it down into parts and steps. Also keep thinking whether or not information you're asking from your user is super important or it can be skipped. Do not ask for any information that your user might feel uncomfortable in providing. If you guys would have noticed earlier, forms used to ask for sex. Nowadays, that field is being skipped from, skipped from forms and max to max you'll be asked to enter your birth date, your phone and other company details. Also, apart from having in-field labels, try to have labels above each field. Asking for more and more information from the user could also lead to a small completion rate. So smaller and tighter the form, more are the chances of a user completing a process and thus more conversions. We can help you A-B test uh, a smaller and tighter form in case you are uh, following a different format. Uh, thank you, Riddhi, for an insightful uh, use case on form filling, on form design, sorry. All right, so uh, guys, what I'm going to do is, again, launch a poll, as promised. Uh, why? Because you have gone through five compelling use cases. And since we, the last poll was asking about whether or not you have an in-house team or you are looking for any assistance, we would like to know if you would like our UX team to get in touch with you for uh, your A-B testing needs or even if you would like to just, you know, uh, run by your uh, A-B testing ideas along with your UX needs. We'll keep this poll open for 10 more seconds. If you say yes, what we'll do is our uh, UX team will get in touch with you and we will hash out all the details and we will help you with your A-B testing and website personalization ideas and we will help you make them um, more optimized so that you can get better results. All right. Thank you, guys. Riddhi, you want to take it forward? Yeah, sure, Aditi. On a concluding line, I would like to say that design trends are something that continuously evolve, but the fundamental user needs remain the same. The user has a goal that he needs to accomplish without a lot of effort. Sometimes design gets mixed up with decor, but design needs to actually help your users achieve their goals. 
design should ultimately be for the users and not for designers. The more easy product we create, more likely our users will use it. All right, awesome. So uh, we are now moving on to our Q&A section. So uh, guys, thank you for uh, sticking with us till the end. We have a few questions, so I'm going to take them up. I'm going to bring them up to Riddhi and she's going to answer them. So if you have any questions, uh, any more questions, please uh, feel free to uh, be sure that you type them up in the question box of your GoToWebinar control panel. And I will take them up one by one. Uh, also, if you have any feedbacks or if you would like to interact with us on Twitter, here's our Twitter handle. Please feel free to get in touch with us. All right. So, uh, Riddhi, it looks like we have a few questions. Uh, the first question is from Rini. She's asking if there is any website or a repository for using the icons that we talked about in one of our use cases. Uh, since many icons have multiple meanings across countries, is there a global website or is there any uh, place or a platform where sh we can you know, go and check? Uh, how can we name a certain set of icons or even just refer to any website? Uh, hi, Rini. I would be very happy to answer your question. Uh, so, there are two websites that I definitely use when I'm designing interfaces. Uh, one of them is the nounproject.com. Uh, this website asks uh, you to just log in and then you can uh, download free credit icons uh, in SVG or PNG form. And it's a royalty free website as well as it has uh, free stuff to offer. Another one is uh, flaticon.com. Over here you will get a lot of icons in color as well as filled, non-filled uh, singular line icons. And uh, a, a lot of other file formats that it offers are EPS, SVG, PNG. You can also edit the icon a little bit before downloading it. And it will have main suggestions to go along with it. Uh, Reni, I hope I've answered your question. Uh, yeah, Reni, uh, I hope Riddhi has been able to answer your question. Also, I will uh, send out the both the URLs that Riddhi just mentioned in, a, in the chat to you so that you have those two refer to. All right. Our uh, next question is from Arti. She's asking if uh, the minimalist design is still trending. Hi, Arti. To answer your question, I would like to say minimalist design at one point of time was a trend. But right now, minimalist design is something that has just become a practice. So while how I said earlier, keep in mind that uh, when you're trying to keep things minimal don't miss out on inf important information like uh, knowledging your users about your gestures or your icon titles or something uh, try and uh, keep it minimal but uh, don't skip out the inf important information I hope I've answered your question Aarti all right uh, Aarti if you have any further questions regarding the same uh, please do get back to me. Okay, so our next question is uh, from Rohan. He's he's asking if there is an optimal text to image ratio when it comes to a website or a landing page or even apps. Hi Rohan, to answer your question, I would like to say that uh, there is no uh, such an optimal ratio for text to image. Uh, because it depends from website to website. In case you have a blog or something, you might want to concentrate your images at one point. But when you are talking about lead generation websites or product websites, I would like to say that in each fold of your website, try to introduce some iconography or some graphics or some photographs to support uh, whatever information that you are trying to portray to the user. Awesome. So uh, Palash is uh, asking if you can please explain the uh, 4.1 to uh, 4.5 to 1 uh, ratio for the contrast to font that we had talked about in the first use case. He just wants to understand it, uh, understand it in a bit of more detail. Palash, if you have any uh, specific uh, doubt also, you can please ask us and I will take it up. Uh, Riddhi, can you please explain the contrast ratio to him uh, sure hi palash uh, i would like to say that 4.5 is to 1 is a contrast ratio so 
you have hex codes for your colors and you have hex codes for your background so how much a color stands out on a background is rated in terms of ratios so your text has to be 4.0 times more effective and more brighter and more appealing more legible than your background you say you cannot have a, a blue uh, text on a black background because that would result to something like just uh, 2 is to 1 or 1.5 is to 1 ratio because blue dark blue is not so much visible on a black background but similarly if you go for blue on a white background your contrast ratio might just come up to almost 8 is to 1 because blue has a very different appeal than white and it stands out when it's put on white uh, i hope i have answered your question palash palash uh, we hope uh, the contrast ratio is more uh, clearer to you uh, well he's also asking if 4.5 is minimum is it the optimal or the minimum requirement? Uh, it's sort of an optimum requirement. It's something that uh, you can also say it's a minimum requirement actually. That uh, it, it, the, your text should at least be four times more visible and standing out from your background. So that your background does not become a distraction for people who are reading the text which is located on it. Awesome. Okay, so uh, our next question is from Rupesh. He is asking, how do we fix the duration of A-B tests? Well, uh, to answer your question, Rupesh, I would be very honest. Uh, you cannot really decide the duration of your A-B test. Uh, so, to tell you truthfully, in case you get a result within even seven days of you posting an A-B test, and it says that there is a clear uh, winner, then you can end the experiment and you can declare the, whichever variant has become the winner. But sometimes you need to look at the graph and see how your variation is trending. If it has gone up two, three times and then gone down once, you would want to wait for a bit longer to make sure that your variant wins. So uh, that is how you would be able to uh, judge the time duration for A-B test. It depends on A-B test to A-B test actually. Uh, uh, Rupesh, I hope this answer your, answers your question. Please uh, feel free to ask if you have any more uh, questions to follow up or any new questions as well. Okay, so our uh, next question is from Ahmed. He is uh, asking if there is any reference uh, to standard guidelines for UX, like material design for UI, and also if there is any quick tool to create onboarding animated tutorials to introducing new app gestures that we talked about in the use case. Uh, to be honest, there are no such uh, guidelines when it comes to UX. It's so much user dependent that you cannot uh, really define it, but uh, to answer your question in terms of a quick tool to create onboarding animated tutorials uh, you can use the sketch app uh, so sketch is uh, actually unfortunately it's only available on the mac right now it allows you to create uh, onboarding animated tutorials so does uh, adobe has launched a new uh, product right now even that allows you to uh, make animated tutorials for your applications so it's called adobe experience Ahmed, I hope that answers your question. Please feel free to uh, write to us again if you have more questions. Uh, all right, so uh, we we actually need to wrap up. But if you have any more questions, or even if we've missed out on any of your questions, please uh, stay assured. Riddhi and I, both of us, will get back to you with uh, we'll get back to you personally with uh, answers to all your queries. Right. Uh, okay. So, well, like I promised, we have a free takeaway for you. Uh, it, it's a demo UX audit. If you would be interested in getting a free demo audit for your website, a UX audit for your website, please write an email to us with this coupon code that's flashing on your screen as your email subject. Also, our next webinar is on. Um, is on getting started with BigQuery. 
Now, I understand the process of registering for a new webinar every week is a little tedious and it's also a little time consuming. So I would love to uh, make that process easier for you. If you could please uh, RSVP right away. What I will do is I will get you registered on your behalf and you will straight away receive um, a confirmation email with your spot registered within the next uh, one working day. I will keep the poll open for 10 more seconds and do let me know if you would love to join us. We look forward to you joining us. All right. Thank you so much for uh, taking the poll and thanks a lot for attending the webinar. I really, Riddhi and I, we both hope you found it insightful and we will get in touch with you for all your A-B tests and UX needs. If you need any help, if you have any more queries, uh, please get in touch with us and we will get back to you. Thank you so much.